Books make you hope. Books make you dream. Books make you laugh. Books make you scream. This is the Books That Make You Show, discussing books with authors and experts, unraveling the inner pages of all the books that help make us who we are. Welcome, everybody. My name is Desiree Duffy, and this is the Books That Make You Show. And today we're talking about books that make you hop on that motorbike and drive up that mountain. Coming of age stories. They're often filled with tales of struggles, fighting to fit into the world, and of course, overcoming obstacles on that journey. And that's exactly what readers get in Danger Peak, the BookFest award winner that takes us back to the 80s where three teens are members of the motorcycle bike racing club called the Wild Boars. And with the inadvertent help of their eccentric technology teacher, Dr. Howard, they build their friend Robert a better, faster, and stronger dirt bike piece by laborious piece. And haunted by flashbacks of Robert's older brother, Danny, who died while trying to scale Danger Peak the year before, well, he discovers what lies beyond the peak of mountains and maybe even beyond the bounds of Earth itself. Michael Thomas Perone, in addition to being an award-winning author, he's written for the Baltimore Sun, Baltimore City Paper, Long Island Voice, among others. Online, he's written for Fatherly, Yahoo, What Culture, and other websites, too. He works as a senior editor in Manhattan and lives on Long Island with his wife and two daughters. Michael, hello. Welcome to the show. Hi, thank you for having me. All right, I gotta ask the big question. You have daughters, but your book is about teenage boys. What's <laughs> up with that? Yeah, well, I, the book is based on a short story I wrote in 1988 when I was 11 years old. So now you know how old I am. So it was <laughs> basically what I was going through at the time. I was riding bikes with my friends. They weren't motorbikes, they were regular bicycles, but I figured motorbikes would be more interesting for the reader. Um, so that's the world I was used to. It was the 80s. It's also why the book is, takes place in the 80s. Um, it's basically the inspiration was three different things. The Like I said, the misadventures I had with my two best friends growing up, riding our bikes. Uh, there's an old school 8-bit Nintendo game called Excite Bike. It's the shirt I'm wearing now. I don't know if you remember that game. It might be before your time. Uh, but it was one of those programmable games where you can add different courses, different obstacles in the course. So one day I built a giant ramp. It looked like a mountain. And then I was riding up the, the mountain on my motorbike. And I thought, that's an interesting image. And I thought, what would be on top of that mountain? And that was like the genesis of the idea. And the third inspiration, unfortunately, was the death of my brother in 1986. So I put those three things together, the death of my brother, the misadventures I had with my friends riding my bikes around town, and uh, the Nintendo game Excite Bike. And I came up with Danger Peak. The original name actually wasn't Danger Peak. It was Excite Bike, but I quickly learned that was trademarked by Nintendo. So I changed it to Action Bike, which is the name of the bike that the kids make. And I was talking to an agent. He said it's a little too masculine sounding, so I uh, should probably make it more gender friendly and change it to something else. He wanted to call it the Wild Boars. You mentioned the name of the club mm -hmm. is the Wild Boars. I thought it's kind of a silly title. People just see Wild Boars. I think it's about a bunch of talking animals. So I changed it to Danger Peak because that's the main goal of the books. That's the main obstacle is climbing the supernatural mountain. I love the name and I love the oh, nostalgia <laughs> it, it brings back. And condolences on your your brother. What oh, thank a you. Thing. It's yeah. Interesting, though, how that convergence of those three things has brought us to where we are. And it's interesting, yeah. too. I mean, I'm, I'm sure you hear this all the time, but Stranger Things and that 80s nostalgia is definitely yeah. back. So do you feel like you're hitting at the you know the right time? Uh, I'm probably a little bit late to the party. Uh, I, mean, I wrote this book a few years ago. Uh, probably the peak was a few years ago with the 80s stuff, but I remember I used to write for uh, Baltimore City Papers and Alternative Weekly, uh, obviously in Baltimore, in 2003. And every week we had to pitch articles to the editor. And at the time, there was a show on TV called That 80s Show. It was one of the makers of That 70s Show. Now, ironically, there's That 90s Show on Netflix, but that's another story. Um, so there was That 80s Show on TV, and there was all these songs that were like poppy, 80s-sounding songs. You had the Backstreet Boys and NC. It was, like, it was like New Kids on the Block. So I was thinking, oh, it's kind of like the 80s coming back. So I pitched an, an article idea to my editor you know, about the 80s coming back, and I went, the 80s are dead. Once Rhino comes out with a greatest hits collection of the 80s, that nostalgia train is over. And I remember being angry, not because he was insulting me, but because I knew how incredibly wrong he was. We had barely cracked the 80s nostalgia. This was 2003. So 20 years later, and I'm not going to go through everything. I made a, a list here. 20 years later, in the past few years, like you mentioned, Stranger Things and that was a huge hit. 
uh, on Netflix. You have uh, the Stephen King adaptations of It Took Place in the 80s, the, the film adaptations a few years ago. The Cobra Kai, one of the biggest shows on Netflix that's been off of the Karate Kid series from the 80s. Last year, Top Gun Maverick was one of the biggest movies of the year. Um, you know, obviously, it's a belated sequel to the 1986 hit with Tom Cruise. You have Ghostbusters Afterlife, but the original cast came out for years. It was the number one movie when it came out. You have the 80s set TV show The Goldbergs. It's been on ABC for 10 years now. Uh, the recent Wonder Woman movie was called Wonder Woman 1984. We can debate its quality, but it did take place in the 80s. Uh, there's two He-Man shows on Netflix, one written by Kevin Smith and the CGI reboot for younger kids. There's a live action film that works. The Transformers movies are always tearing up the charts. Again, we could debate their quality, but they're always successful when they come out. Ready Player One was an 80s set novel, kind of like my novel, uh, directed by the film version was directed by Steven Spielberg, huge hit. So that was only in the past few years, and, and I knew how wrong the guy was. I kind of feel like I'm vindicated after all that. <laughs> Did you just send him that list? <laughs> no, we, not, we haven't talked. We haven't talked in a while. We haven't talked. That's, that's a different lifetime. <laughs> uh, I understand. Well, it, it, it's true. We, we look back at our childhood. And when I say we, I'm talking about people who lived the, in the 80s. I mean, I grew up in the 80s. I'm actually a little bit older than you. So uh, I, I definitely think that when we, you know, when it comes to our kids and even our grandkids, bringing back something nostalgic like that is in a way just it, it brings things full circle it's it's very profound in a lot of ways and do you feel that this coming of age story in any way then reflects you coming full circle as a as a person as an author a writer um it's interesting because when i first started writing i mean the the short story version obviously was set in the 80s because i wrote it in the 80s i started writing the novel version 2019 2020 i remember the exact year but it's a few years ago and it originally was not set in the 80s. It was just any time, you know, it was just universal. But, you know, it's so the book is sort of a love letter to my childhood. And I happened to grow up in the 80s. So every time I wanted to go for a reference to a song or a movie or a TV show, or whatever was going on, you know, I had the 80s on the brain. So at first I was fighting it. I'm like, nah, this is a little cheesy. But then I just went for it. And it became more fun. And, and it actually made the story better. And, you know, it's not, you know, for, I can understand people like this is, you know, that's a cheesy gag just to throw in 80s references. But I want people to know if they haven't read the book. It's not like I just come out there and go, He-Man, Transformers, Ghostbusters, Indiana Jones, good night, everyone. You know, the, I try to incorporate the references to the 80s organically to the story. I can give you two quick examples. Um, Robert Kennedy's the main character of the book. He goes to see the movie Batman from 1989, the 1999 film version. And then in the cafeteria the next day, his friends are reading a Batman comic and he sees the utility belt on Batman's costume. And he says, well, you know, Batman needs uh, better tools to beat the bad guys. I need a better bike to beat this mountain. So that's where he gets the idea to build the action bike. So that's one example. Another example is one of the uh, add-ons to the bike. One of the enhancements is called a turbocharger. What it does, it makes the bike go really fast, but only for a short amount of time, for like 10 or 15 seconds. And they get the idea from Knight Rider from that. I don't know if you remember that show. It might be before your time. But Knight Rider, they had a turbo boost button on the car and it would go really fast you know, in a short amount of time. And, you know, when I was a kid, I was always watching the show. I was wondering, like, you know, why don't he, why didn't he use that button at the beginning of the chase until the end of the chase? You know, he's always wasting until the last second to use that button, but the episodes would be half as long, I guess, if he waited that long. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> I remember Kit with the red yeah. light that went back and forth. And uh, I love that show when I was a kid. David Hasselhoff, exactly. So now you have a little bit of magic in the book too, from the sounds yeah. of it. Yeah, I, mean, I know we can't know, I'm dying to know what they find yeah. at the top of the mountain, but yeah. can, can you talk Very a little cool. bit about, <laughs> yeah, infusing the magic and the mystery into it? Um, yeah, I always loved the genre of magical realism where, you know, I don't have to explain this to you, but you know, everything in the story is pretty much the real world. It's like, it's like 99% it's the real world, but there's one thing in the book that's not, there's one thing that's magical. And, you know, I, first got into this genre when I read the, the book Mail Order of Wings. Uh, it's this book where this girl uh, orders these wings from a comic book and everything in the book is the real world, but these wings make her fly. And I thought that's a really great idea. That's really interesting. So in my book, everything is the real world except for this mountain. And, and I tell people in the prologue, some people are surprised that it's like, well, I tell you in the prologue, this is a supernatural mountain. There's something special on top of the mountain. I'm going to tell you what it is, but there's something there. It's worth getting to the end to read it. And if I, you know, if I told you now, it probably wouldn't mean anything because you have to read the book to get why it's important, why it's special. You know, there's some things that are mentioned in the book and people might be wondering why, why is he mentioning all this stuff? But it's like I'm planting a little seed somewhere. You get to me, I'm like, oh, that's why he mentioned that. So yes, the mountain is magical. Nothing really else 
as much. I mean, yes, there are some lasers, but that's like an invention. <laughs> so there's some science fiction stuff, but it, it's mostly the real world. And and I just, I don't know. It's I like restrictions. If everything is too much fantasy, <clears throat> nothing against Harry Potter and Lord of the Rings, but when it's like orcs and werewolves and demons and vampire romances, it's like it's it's too much for me. It's like I need to simplify it. I like having one thing that's magical, and then you can play with the world. How how does that magical item? Has that magical artifact affect the rest of this normal world? I like yeah. that idea. <clears throat> yeah. Well, I mean, you can take something like the Marvel Universe, and I love the Marvel Universe. I love the movies. I, as well as a lot of people, are starting to get burnt out. And you look at some of the premises. It's like if they've got all these superpowers, why don't they just do this thing? Why? <laughs> you, because they've infused. There's too much magic. You yeah, have characters that are so powerful that the fight to kind of use your example, it'll be over like that. It, yeah. And so by having just a little bit of magic, like what you're doing, you create the tension and the drama and the mystery and the intrigue. So it's um, more of an obstacle for the characters. It's more of a challenge. It makes it more that much more rewarding instead of just well, I'm going to snap my finger and I'm going to change everything with my magic powers. Another thing about the Marvel movies, I'm wondering like, Certain Marvel movies, you're like, well, you know, Iron Man or uh, or uh, Doctor Strange, they, they're in trouble. It's like you guys live in the same city, you know, just call them on the phone. It's like the individual movies, they never, except for the Avengers, like the individual movies, they never get together except on the Avengers movies. It's like you guys are right next to each other. If you need help, call each other. Right, right. Exactly. Exactly. And yeah, I mean, we could go on about Marvel, but I, I, I want to talk more about your book and um, everything that you've got going on here. Yeah. So what do you feel that the reader, the main theme or the main takeaway that readers have from this book? I think, oh, well, this is the obvious theme that we mentioned about, you know, conquering your challenges and, and conquering your obstacles. And there's the obvious metaphor of climb every mountain. There's literally a mountain in my book, a magical one, in fact. Uh, another major theme, though, is overcoming and conquering grief and, and living with that grief. I mean, you may, may not conquer it, but you have to live with it. Um, and, you know, everyone knows someone close to them who's died. For some, it's happened sooner than others. For me, it happened when I was eight. Uh, and I hope people, what people take away with it is that just because the person you love is gone doesn't mean the love you had for that person has to be gone as well. That's one of the major themes of the book. Oh, that's amazing. Now, what does your family, your current family, your wife and daughters, as well as um, other members of your family, what are their thoughts on the book? Uh, well, varied. <laughs> um, it took a while for my, my wife to read it, but uh, she liked it. My kid's a little bit young uh, to be reading this kind of book. Um, uh, my mom cried, obviously. I mean, it's very personal for her. Uh there's, there's another aspect of the book that I haven't brought up, and that is the relationship between Robert, the main character, and his father. There's a tension there. Robert feels like he's in the shadow of his older brother who passed away. I know I felt that out, that way uh, myself. And, you know, I, you know I, I exaggerated the father. I would figure he's not exactly based on my father, but, you know, there was that tension there. I felt like, you know, he was the real son that he wanted, and he's now he's gone, he's missing. So one thing I wanted to do with this book is have the father and the son reconcile at the end, sort of giving away the ending. But, you know, obviously it's a happy ending. And, you know, I was, it was very cathartic writing this book. You know, this is my therapy writing this book. And uh, my father read it and he, he kind of got it. And he's like, well, I'm sorry if I made you feel that way. He did not feel that way. I felt he, he felt that way, but I was wrong, you know, and I might not have known that had I not written this book. And he read it and, and, and said, oh, that's how you felt. You know, like, you know, never, never. I never felt that way. But, you know, the things you learn when you write books. <laughs> yeah. Well, you're touching on something there that is so true and profound. Writing is a catharsis and it's a way to think about your own life. So it's as much therapeutic for the writer a lot of times as it is for the person reading it, because then in turn, you're touching people's lives who might be living through that now or experience it one day and you're giving them some insights and some some tools to, to help them as well. So I'm curious, do you have any advice to other writers, tips, anything that you would want to bestow on to a writer who's thinking about sitting down and putting that pen to paper? Um, be true to yourself. You know, I don't have anything very deep or wise to say, but, you know, I was writing this book in my head for, you know, decades. You know, I mean, there's the short story version in the 80s, but it's been in my head for decades. Like, when am I going to actually put this 
thing to paper and uh it just flew out i mean it took three or four months for the first draft it just i couldn't stop writing and i realized like i i, I had to write it and i think for people maybe who are like me procrastinating postponing it it's like it's it it's healing it, it's it helps you know it's uh it's cheaper than therapy <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Well, a lot of writers I know too talk about journaling and putting their thoughts down that way. So a lot of times, even if you don't ever intend on releasing it as a book, just the act of doing that, I think can be really powerful and, and can help us get through yeah. things. I have reams and reams of diaries in my basement somewhere from when I was a kid. Yeah. And it's also it's funny reading back, you think, oh, it was a certain way. You, you felt this way. This happened. This happened. This is such a great year. And then you're reading it like, oh, I forgot that happened. Yeah, that was bad. Yeah, I didn't like that at all. This wasn't such a great year after all. You know, it's, it's fun. Yeah. Back to well, we always remember things with a, that air of nostalgia. Yeah, yeah, fondness. Now, <laughs> remembering all the bad stuff. Exactly. Now, going back, you're talking about the fact that this is built, built off of the short story. How closely did you follow the short story? How much do you use? And have you ever published or let anybody read the actual source material? Well, well, I mean, it was an 11 year old story, so it's not that deep. <laughs> um, and obviously not that long. I think it was only 35, 40 pages. That's uh, pretty long. One. Well, yeah, but, you know, it was written longhand, so it wasn't typed. <laughs> This is before I had a computer or a typewriter. Um, lost my train of thought. Uh, I, I think, you know, in the beginning, it was like my outline. I had it. It's like, okay, let me this. I'll just expand a little bit here, expand a little bit there. But I, I quickly realized I couldn't do that because then the book would only be 50 pages long. So one aspect of the story that was good, and one of the reasons why I picked this short story to be expanded to a novel, is that the bulk of the book is building this bike. So I said, well, I can have a few extra add-ons to this bike and maybe they get into more hijinks and they get in more trouble and more complications to get, you know, to their goal of developing this bike. So that's that much more rewarding and satisfying when they finally do and they finally climb this mountain. So <clears throat> that helped just the nature of the story that helped um, add, and make the book a, a full-length novel. Now, do you have any plans for additional books with these characters? Is this no, one that, and done? Yeah, it's a common question. I'm done. <laughs> I told the story. I'm not one of those people who's like, oh, Danger Peak 2, Danger Peak 3, you know, Electric Boogaloo. I'm not doing that. I mean, I told the stories at the beginning, clear beginning, middle and end. I'm happy with that. I'm satisfied with it. I am writing another book. Do these characters make a very, very brief cameo in it? Yes, they do. Is it so short? It's only two sentences, maybe. Uh, but it's a different story. Uh, it, it doesn't, it's not about Danger Peak. It's not about these kids. Now, you traveled to Times Square to see your book up on the NASDAQ board as part of the Salute to the Book Fest Award winners. What was that like? It was exciting. You know, I, I wrote a blog about it. I'm, you know, I grew up on Long Island, so I would always go into the city with my parents and my sister and do all the touristy stuff, you know, Rockefeller Center and the Empire State Building. Times Square obviously was a, a big part of that, so... You know, when you're a kid, you look up at this giant electronic billboard and you're thinking to yourself, oh, one day, maybe one day something I create is going to be up there. But you're fooling yourself and everything's going to happen. And then I get an email like, hey, do you want your book to be in Times Square? I'm like, um, yes, please. How fast can I say yes? Uh, and it was great. You know, it's, you know, the, and the, the, the 18, 19 or so are the people who got up there. And we were very happy. We were very proud. And we felt very lucky that, you know, something that you that was in your head for me anyway in 19... 88 and now it's on a giant electronic billboard in 2022 <laughs> very cool very cool um and and yeah you you're a writer i've read your blog by the way i read oh, that blog thanks. Post. you're the one <laughs> <laughs> well you write for a lot of different outlets too magazines and websites and, and yeah stuff. in the past i did that but i'm focusing more on my book writing now and the blog <laughs> excellent excellent um how about if if I, I I love asking this question, but I'm going to throw in the caveat that your answer cannot be Oprah. If you could hand this book to anybody in the world and be guaranteed that they would indeed read it, who would you hand your book to? Oprah. No. <laughs> um, anyone living or dead? Yeah. Well, I mean, dead people really can't do much with it, but sure. That's that's a good point. Uh, I'll answer both dead and living dead. Uh, I would give a copy to my brother. It's dedicated to him. It's the first page says for Stephen. Um, living, I 
I love LeVar Burton. I would give him a copy. I grew up on reading Rambo. I love that show. He's got podcasts now. Um, and so if I was in an elevator with him, it's like, hey, LeVar, it's like, slip him this copy. Pie in the Sky, you know, this is an obvious answer, but for me, especially with my books about Steven Spielberg, you know, I was obviously very influenced by his movies. So I could be like, you know, hey, Steven, looking for your next project, you know, uh, looking to get back to your roots. I mean, he directed Ready Player One, so, you know, stranger things have happened. And the last person I would give it to is my sixth grade teacher, Mr. Joyce. He was mentioned in the acknowledgement section of the book. Um, he gave me a writing award when I graduated in elementary school. Uh, and he gave a speech. He said I was the finest creative writer he ever taught. I think he was only teaching for a few years at that time, but I'll take the compliment anyway. Um, I tried finding him. I, I Googled an address, sent the book out, find out, found out it was an old address. So he didn't get the book. So if he's listening to this, if he's watching this, Mr. Joyce, please get in contact with me at DangerPeak.com. I'll send you a book. Oh, that's awesome. Now, was he the inspiration for the instructor? No, in the book? no, he's, I, I don't know if you read it, but he's kind of like a quasi villain. I didn't want to make him too cartoonishly evil. He does help the kids some, I'm first of all, he helps them build a bike, but he doesn't know he's helping them build a bike. Um, but he's, he does kind of have a soft spot for these kids, even though he doesn't show it. Um, but no, he's, uh, if anything, he's sort of based on a music teacher I had who refused to be called Mr. I'm going to say his last name, but he, get, he, he had a doctorate in music, I guess. Um, and so he refused because he wanted to be called Dr. his last name. And if you forgot that, he would not answer your question. You know, Mr. Blank, can you blah, blah, blah? It's doctor. And I always kept that in the back of my mind. I was like, that's a quirk. That's a funny quirk. That's annoying right now, but that's funny. So I gave this trait to Dr. Howard. So it happens, it's a running gag in the book. And they say, oh, Mr. Howard, it's like, it's doctor. You know, what are you a doctor of? If someone's having a heart attack, you're not going to be able to help this person, okay? You're not a doctor. I'm sorry. That's what's running gag. <laughs> right, right. That's hilarious. I did see that in your, your bio and your description. That's you true. have got so much, yeah, so much going on. Can you, Michael, tell everybody where they can go to find your website, your blog, follow your writing, and of course, find your book? You can find my book on Amazon or barnesandnoble.com. If you want to shop local, you can go to any bookstore and just ask them to order it and they'll get it from Ingram. Uh, you can find me on dangerpeak.com. If you sign up for blog updates on my blog page, I'll send you a free PDF copy of my book, Lists, Life, and Other Unimportant Details. It's a collection of my best articles and published, published articles and best blogs in the past 25 years. Uh, on social media, I'm not too active on social media. Um, I'm not on uh, TikTok. <laughs> But uh, on Facebook, you are now. <laughs> oh, am I? <laughs> That's right. Hi, TikTok. Um, Facebook, I'm at Danger Peak Book. Apparently, there was already a Danger Peak Facebook. I, I'm not sure why. So, Danger Peak Book on Facebook. On Twitter, it's just Danger Peak, one word, Danger Peak. Oh, Michael, thank you so much for joining us. I appreciate sure, you spending for having the me. time with us. Yeah. Sorry for the technical difficulties before. But... It happens. It happens. Yeah. It happens. No worries. And thank you, everybody, for being with us today as well. You can find out more about us on our website. It's bookstatmakeyou.com. We're also on Facebook and Instagram. And yes, on TikTok as well, of course, YouTube, where you can subscribe and ring that bell, leave some comments, you know, engage with us there in the book community there yeah there's the cover there's the it's cover so pretty <laughs> it is. The awards it won. It so, so much better than the the oh no that's, i love that that's awesome i'm glad you did that thank you i should have yeah. mentioned that before i'm sorry that's that's okay yeah I, I i try to always put some element of the book or the cover yeah. back there as, as best i'm I can. sure you get it but you got it Yes, yes. Until next time, all of my bookish buddies, please. Oh, that's the other thing. And don't forget, you can join us on thebookfest.com as well. The Bookfest is held twice a year in the spring and the fall. And yes, we sponsor the Bookfest Awards. And that's where Michael came to us here today. You can watch and listen and check out all of those Bookfest videos for free. Just go to thebookfest.com, sign up so you get email alerts and you'll never miss a bookish things from your friends at the book fest and from books that make you until next time all of my book buddies please enjoy all of the books that make you exactly who you are the host and executive producer of the books that make you show is desiree duffy sound mastering and engineering by dave napox social media and content promotion by city jaha girdar copywriting and editing by mike robinson the Books That Make You Show is an award-winning podcast produced by Black Chateau Enterprises. 